When I started this project about a year ago, we were hoping for like a 40-person seminar, you know, in someone's house. So this is, this is uh, incredible to see so many people here today. My name is Matthew Wee, and I am an undergraduate from Singapore studying history at Columbia University in New York. I am the lead organizer of this conference together with my classmates, Luke Hillian. And one of our other colleagues, uh, Stephanie Chan, will be joining us online. So full disclosure, my specialization is actually quite far from the subject of, of this conference. I focus on modern American intellectual history and, and the history and uh, philosophy of science. However, ever since I was young, I've always had an interest in the history of my own heritage as a Singaporean. Um, and so, like many of you, I, I'm here today to broaden my own perspective on Singapore's past and its relationship to Southeast Asia. And we are honored to have such a, a diverse audience here today, ranging from high school students to professors and professionals of various fields. One of the goals of this event is to bring together academic and popular understandings of Southeast Asian history. So we love that we have brought together as well a spectrum of people from students to laymen to experts. We want to first recognize our sponsor, the Davis Projects for Peace Foundation, a fund started by the late philanthropist, Catherine Davis. We'd also like to recognize the ACM for providing this wonderful venue, and special thanks to, uh, thanks to their team, Faisal, Angeline, Yanni, and Daphne, as well as the custodial staff. I want to personally thank Mr. Keir Johari, my fellow organizers, Luke and Stephanie, and our assistants, Irene, Shelley, Mirjani, and last but not least, I wish to thank all of our speakers uh, and caterers, Angie, Angie and uh, Chef De Silva for preparing an amazing lineup of talks and food today. W one of our speakers, Professor John Mixick, unfortunately had to drop out at the last minute due to health complications, but we would like to thank him for being a part of this project ever since last year. Without all of your support, this conference would not have been possible. I would like to start by explaining how the idea of our conference came to be. We, we began as a Columbia student group called the History Lab Malaysia under the leadership of Arman Hussein, a Rhodes Scholar and Columbia student from Malaysia to whom this project owes much gratitude. Arman's original vision was to address what he saw as, as a declining status and lack of interest in history in Southeast Asia by designing a, a cutting edge history curriculum that would teach Singapore and Malaysian history in conjunction with digital humanities. And long story short, the project ran into some issues and Arman graduated. This year, Stephanie and I decided to revive the project and to reapply for the Davis Grant. Like Arman, we are concerned about the declining interest in Southeast Asian history, and so we wanted to do something with a more limited scope that still fit Arman's vision of making history more interesting and more accessible. So Stephanie suggested a conference, and here we are. In keeping with Arman's vision, the purpose of this conference is to weave together different perspectives on Singapore history and to unpack its many layers. I'll explain what that means in a moment. First, I want to emphasize what this conference is not. We are not pushing an agenda, we are not roping in any contemporary issues, and we are not here to pass a judgment on people, institutions, or previous understandings of our history. Our goal is not to overturn myth and uncover truth. The binaries of truth and reality, after all, are a false dichotomy in, in the field of history where so much of our object of analysis is defined by the questions that we choose to ask. So the aim of our conference, rather, is to get people thinking more deeply about how we know about history and how history is created, disseminated, and hypostatized or, or made into fact. For those reasons, I stress that this conference is about historiography as much as history. Historiography is a study of how history is made. It is, in, in some sense, the history of history. And so what, what we hope to show is that different, sometimes competing narratives of our history each have their own social political origins in, in, in the not-so-distant past. And so thinking about how different historical narratives are made and then made known or unknown is an integral part of how we approach a complex sub, uh, subject such as Singaporean history. For example, the idea of Raffles as a founding father of modern Singapore was not preordained when he landed here in, in 1819. It is an idea that was consciously pursued by people in the late 19th and 20th century, 
an idea that was then reproduced in textbooks, speeches, and monuments. And we actually stand today on, on, the, on the ground of one such monument. So you, you can see the, icon, uh, the iconic statue of Raffles at Empress Place outside my window to, to the left, marking the spot where he landed here about 200 years ago. And some of you may be, may be surprised to learn that it was actually Lee Kuan Yew's economic advisor, the Dutch economist, Albert Winsimius, who suggested keeping the statue to portray Singapore's friendly and welcoming disposition to Western business. Again, the point here is not to pass judgment, but to show how innocuous decisions in the present shape how we memorialize the past, which in turn affects how we understand it, such as is the social construction of historical fact. So our conference today will not only show that Singapore had a very long and rich history predating Raffles 1819 arrival, equally important and interesting is the story of how we came to know about this period and the reasons for its previous obscurity. Long before the 19th century, Singapore was a highly successful and sophisticated trading port. Under the, under the name Tamasek, it experienced a golden age in the 13th and 14th centuries thanks to its privileged geog geographical position on the maritime trade routes that connected Europe, India, the Middle East, China, and Southeast Asia. Knowledge about Tamasek and its relationship to maritime trade is nothing new. A lot of the information from this period was first sourced from classical texts, such as the Malay Annals, which dates to around the 17th century. And thanks to Professor Kwa Chung Guan and Professor Peter Borschberg's book, Studying Singapore Before 1800, we now know that as early as the 19th century, there was already much interest in uncovering Tamasek and early Singapore. In, in the last 50 years, this period has garnered even more renewed academic interest, thanks to archaeological work such as that pioneered by Professor John Mixick, as well as recently illuminated, illuminated documents from non-English archives, we now have more knowledge about pre-1800 Singapore than at, at any other given point in our history. And even secondary school textbooks have been revised to reflect these revisions in knowledge. There was a sense before that, that there was nothing left to discover about early Singaporean history, that we, we thought we knew everything there was to know. But today, we have so much information that the, the limiting factor is actually finding the people with an interest in doing the scholarship and people who have the linguistic acumen to parse through uh, sources in their original language. And importantly, the ultimate goal is to find the wealth of perspective that comes with such widespread interest. So we are not here today to present a novel rereading of Singaporean history. That, ha that, that has been done and is an ever ongoing project. Instead, we wish to highlight decades of painstaking research that have already taken place from archeological to archival. So starting off, Professor Kwa will discuss the archaeological record of pre-modern Singapore, starting with the 1984 excavations at Fort Canning. Professor Borschberg will talk about the wealth of non-archaeological sources available and how we handle them as historians. What we want to show is how much there is left to know about early modern Singapore and the many opportunities for new scholarship in the field. The later aspect of our conference will center on how post-colonial theory can inform the study of history, particularly the historiography of a post-colonial region such as Southeast Asia. So to set a foundation for our later speakers, I will introduce two figures, uh, Franz Fanon and, and Edward Said. So in, in the 1950s and early 60s, the Afro-Caribbean theorist Franz Fanon was, was an early exponent of analyzing the psychological dimensions of colonialism. He argued that colonialism was not just a form of economic and, and political domination, but subsisted on constituting new subjectivities of people. In, in other words, it was contingent on getting people to adopt, accept, and internalize certain Eurocentric frames of thinking. Edward Said adopts an adjacent line of reasoning several decades later in his seminal work, Orientalism, published in 1978. Orientalism is an intellectual history of how Europeans have studied the Middle East and Asia, where Said argues that purportedly objective observations about, about Asia were defined more by the stereotypes that, that Western intellectuals impose on Asians rather than something innate to Asia itself. And these, stereo, these stereotypes and myths were then propelled to the stratosphere of objective fact as they were reproduced again and again in, by further generations of scholarship that recapitulated its, uh, its central axioms. 
And so Orientalism serves as a useful exercise in understanding how certain stereotypes and myths through their reproduction in a discourse go on to achieve cultural salience. Both Fanon and Said postulated variations of the premise that colonialism was a reality-defining paradigm. So it was a way of experiencing the world that permeates everything from our sexual desires to perceptions of ourself. Fanon called it a, a total project. Said, boring from the great Michel Foucault, called it a discourse. And because of this, they argue that the project of decolonization is a difficult one, that despite the physical disappearance of colonialism, vestiges of Eurocentric thinking and epistemologies continue to impact the way that we produce knowledge about the world. History is no exception. For professor of sociology, uh, Farid Alatas, and popular historians, Tim Hannigan and Chris Hale, will discuss the challenges and paradoxes of writing a history of Southeast Asia in a post-colonial world. In fact, it was Professor Farid Alatas's father, the renowned social scientist Syed Hussein Alatas, who first applied a post-colonial framework to the study of Singapore historiography in his incisive analysis titled Thomas Stanford Raffles, Schemer or Reformer. Professor Farid Alatas continues to work on many similar and adjacent themes as a sociologist of post-colonial knowledge, and his talk will discuss historiography and autonomous history. Dr. Tim Hannigan, who has published both popular histories in Southeast Asia, as well as academic work, will address the, the hagiography of Raffles as a great man of modern Singapore history. Next, the award-winning historian and documentarian Chris Hale, whose most recent work recounted a popular history of Singapore and Malaysia, will address the reasons for why the 200-year history of Singapore, starting in 1819, has proved so hard to dislodge. And last but certainly not least, we will pivot away from post-colonial theory and to the work of Professor Wang Gangwu, a godfather and pioneer in Southeast Asian history. This will offer an alternate approach to Singapore history that situates it within the transregional activity of the region. One of the key questions to, to keep in mind is how we understand Singapore history as the product of overarching cycles of trade and foreign activity within Southeast Asia, and how we understand the relationship between different levels of history from local to transnational. Our, our intention in bringing these different conversations together on Singapore history is to show how malleable the study of history is, how much it is defined by perspective, and, and uh, the questions that we choose to adopt. Although, although the narrative we are most familiar with is that of a 200-year history stretching back to 1819 with Raffles, we want to show that, that there is so much more depth to Singapore history, of which we are, we are only beginning to scratch the surface. And we focus on three aspects of historical depth. The temporal depth of doing a 700-year history that begins in, in the 13th century, the epistemic depth of getting deeper into a wider diversity of sources, and the historiographical depth that consists of scrutinizing the creation and popularization of different historical narratives. By applying these three levels of depth, we will see that Singapore history is not linear, uninteresting, and set in stone, but is a mosaic of different relationships, temporalities, narratives, and identities. There is not just one, but many different versions, many different ontologies of Singapore's history. And most of all, Understanding how to think about these different histories is deeply interesting and valuable for the present. Thank you.